From the beginning you loved us And from your heart you have expressed it Through the eternal gift that you gave And all these six days you created The world masterpiece you painted But the seventh was exceptional Maker of the universe, I praise you on your Sabbath day. I thank you for this time that you have hallowed. The day that I can rest in you, glorious and holy. The day that you delight in, a gift for the world that you create. On the day that you have given me Ooh. As time passed by we grew so distant And we forgot the gift you gave us The gift that will remind us who you are Yeah mm -hmm. But then you sent your own Son, for him to show us the way home by example he restored maker of the universe I praise you on your Sabbath day I thank you for this time that you have hallowed a day that I can rest in you folks my name is pastor Lionel Martell of the Spring Valley Seventh-day Adventist Church and my prayer for you today is that you are healthy and wise and also too blessed to be stressed out by the cares of this life and especially on this happy holy day of God today's message is one of solemn importance and we will be speaking from the subject 
the ten virgins of Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. Due to the times in which we are living, I cannot help but overemphasize, my friends, the dire importance of strict obedience to the Holy Spirit and the commandments of God. For Jesus said, if you love me, prove it. Keep my commandments. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. So as you listen to today's message, please do so with this thought in mind. A well-known servant of God, and a favorite author of mine put it actually in these words. She said, many will be lost while hoping and desiring to be Christians. They do not come to the point of yielding the will to God. They do not now, right now, choose to be Christians. It is exceedingly crucial at this time, therefore, that we surrender ourselves completely to the Holy Spirit of God so Christ can live in us to cleanse us and then save us by his grace. So my friends, please, let's not lose our souls because of a lack of cooperation with God's Holy Spirit, but rather let us resolve to turn over all of the habits, practices, and vices in our lives contrary to God's will to the Holy Spirit before it is eternally too late, my friends, so we can be sealed in righteousness and be truly married like the wise virgin to Jesus, the Lamb of God. God bless you, and let us keep one another in prayer as we seek to submit ourselves to the influence, the guidance, and the constraining power of the Holy Ghost. God bless you. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Welcome to Spring Valley Seventh-day Adventist Church. My name is Antoinette Bailey Fider. The Bible tells us in Psalms 104.25 to enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord, he is good. His mercies are everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. When we read a scripture like that, one does not even have to guess what kind of attitude we need to have as we enter into the house of the Lord to worship Him, at least a virtual church that is. Forget all about your worries and your cares of the week and place them all at His feet. If you're joining us for the very first time, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to every one of you and thank you for joining us. Our speaker for today is none other than our very own Pastor Lionel Martel. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the worship service. Thank you and God bless. How sweet the sound That saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind But now I see T'was great that taught my heart to fear In grace my fears relieved How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed My chains are Grace 
has promised good to me His word, my hope, seek yours He will my shield and portion be As long as life endures Shall soon dissolve like snow The sun forbear to shine But God who called me here below Will be forever mine Will be Forever mine You are forever mine Today's scripture reading is taken from Matthew 25 verse 13 Watch therefore for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. It takes so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus said the Lord. Father God, I come in no other name but in the mighty name of Jesus. How excellent is your name in all the earth. I give you all praise, honor, and glory, O God, for who you are. You are the God of all righteousness. You are the Holy One. You are the I Am. O God, I ask, O God, that you wash me now thoroughly of my sins. Burn out every dross of sin. Leave no residue. Create in me, O God, a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. O God, as I pray on behalf of your people, I pray that my prayer will go up as sweet incense. O oh God, I ask, O oh God, the Lord, you will help each one that is bowing in your presence right now. O oh God, the Lord, they will trust in you with all their heart. They will not lean on their own understanding. In all ways, O oh God, we'll acknowledge you so you can direct our path. Lord Jesus, here we are at the altar. Help us to cast all our cares upon you, knowing that you care for us. You said in your words, O oh God, that you supply all our needs according to your riches in glory. You said you'll never leave us nor forsake us. You say I'll protect our going out and our coming in. You say, O oh God, you'll grant us the desires of our heart. So hear our cry today, Lord, as our faces differ, so our needs, so our circumstances. Lord, we realize we are living in a world, oh God, with so many disasters, pestilence, oh God, wars, oh God, rumors of war, oh Father God, crime and violence, so many unrest in the cities, oh God, rage and fire, oh God, storms one behind the other, flood waters are rising, 
Oh God, I ask that you intervene. You said in your words, God, that when the enemy comes in like a flood, you lift up a standard against him. Lord, we see where COVID-19 has, has um, taken so many lives, dear God. Oh, it has dis disrupted the lives of, of, of your people. Oh God, we are not able to, to assemble in, 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 in the churches. Oh God, we are not able to do the things that we used to do. Oh God, there's so many things, so many changes. But we realize that we are living in the last days. So Lord, help each one of us to live a holy and acceptable life. Father God, you are calling us to holiness. It can't be business as usual. Our lives must be transformed, dear God. I pray, God, the Lord, you will touch us with your transforming power. So, God, our lives will be changed. And, Lord, we live a holy and acceptable life. Live out your righteous obedience in and through us, oh God. Help us to take on the character of Christ. Because, God, we want, we want to know that we are ready we are ready to receive your seal. Oh God, we are ready for the, the outpouring, oh God, of the Holy Spirit. Our life must be in line with your words, dear God. Oh Lord, hear our cry. We realize, oh God, that the, the enemy come not but to kill, steal, and to destroy. But God, we are so thankful that you come to give life and to give it more abundantly. We want to pray, oh God, for the sick and afflicted ones. Oh Father God, this shutting. So many, oh God, have, have to be in quarantine. So many, oh God, oh, have to, have to be, 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 be at home. When their loved ones in the hospital, they can't even visit. Father God, so many in the hospitals that are on their last breath. Oh God, I pray that Lord, since you will be able to send someone, even the nurses and the doctors, that they, oh God, touch their lips that they can minister to these people. Oh God, we pray for nurses and doctors. Oh God, they, oh God, have to be on the front line. They're putting their lives and the lives of their loved ones at risk. Oh God, I pray that Lord, you would protect and shield them. Oh God, we pray for all the first responders. Oh God, the Lord, you will protect them. You will cover them. Cover them under your blood, Jesus. Cover your people under your blood. You promise, oh God, that you will protect our going out and coming in. Oh God, you said a thousand shall fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand and no harm shall come nigh us. Oh, you give your angels charge to hold us in the palm of their hands so we don't dash our foot against a stone. Oh, you, the strong tower, the righteous, run to you and is safe. Oh God, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that your eyes is moving to and fro the earth. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that your eyes are upon your people. We ask, O oh God, for your continued protection. Shield us, O oh God, from this virus. O oh God, shield us from what is happening out there. O oh Father God, so many crime and violence, so many deaths, so many accidents. O oh God, we're asking you to have mercy upon us. Oh God, I want to ask that today you will open up our hearts as we seek to hear a word from you. Touch the speaker of the hour, God, with a life call from the altar. And we pray, God, that the word that you have given today, oh God, will reach the hearts of every individual and that lives will be transformed. Oh God, anoint everyone taking part in this service. And Lord, we ask that you continue to help us to hold on. To help us to let our anchor hold. Oh God, the Lord, we will stand on the solid rock, Christ Jesus. And nothing will separate us from you. Lord, we want to see you face to face. What a day that will be 
When my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face. Oh God, I pray that everyone will have the same determination to see you face to face. Hear our cry, attend unto our plea today. And Lord, whatsoever I should have asked at this moment and I fail, fail not to grant, but please to make up in giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Yes, you're holy. Yes, 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and welcome once again to the worship services of the Spring Valley Seventh-day Adventist Church. I am very happy to be with you once again today. On the day that the Lord hath made, we ought to rejoice and be glad in it, because God is good all the time, and all the time our wonderful Marvelous God is incredible. Our subject today is entitled Oil Crisis. Oil Crisis. But before we dig into it, we want to position the throne of grace for the divine guidance of the Holy Spirit. From beginning to end, we need him each and every step of the way. That's why the songwriter says, I need thee every hour. Well, I need him through my message too, that we might be inspired and convicted and strengthened in our relationship with the Lord. So Heavenly Father God, we pray today that your Holy Spirit will overshadow me. Lord, take complete control of my mind, my thoughts, my words, my expressions, the very intonation of the voice. We pray that your Holy Spirit, O oh God, will affect the will of God through us. Wash us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and bring the scales down from our eyes that we might see the truth just and only as it is in Jesus. We pray today, let somebody be touched, somebody hear a word of encouragement and uplifted, upliftment, somebody be healed, we pray today, as we claim all this in Jesus' name, amen and amen oil crisis. You see folks, today I'm going to say just a few words about oil, which just happens to be one of the world's most precious commodities. In fact, the world's economy is very much dependent, my friends, upon oil. It is the world's primary source of energy, and we are told that globally we consume at least 11 billion tons of oil from fossil fuel every single year. Uh-huh. The statisticians tell us that crude oil reserves are vanishing from off this earth at a rate of 4 billion tons a year. That's a lot of oil. And then on top of that, we are told that if we continue at this rate, that all our known oil deposits could possibly run out in less than 53 years. Can you imagine that? The world's economy is very much dependent upon oil for its survival. That's why over time, you see, there's been a lot of fighting over oil in the world. In fact, 
fighting over oil has been sort of like off the charts. I can't even begin to tell you of the wars that have been waged to date over oil. World War I, from 1914 to 1918, was waged over oil. World War II, from 1939 to 1945, waged over oil. The Gulf War, 1990 to 1993, was waged over oil. The Sudanese Civil War, 1993 to 2005, was waged over oil. We are told that in 1979 that the Soviet Union actually invaded Afghanistan over oil, and that from 1980 to 1988, Iraq and Iran had it out over oil. Israel and the Arab states are always fussing, feuding, and fighting over oil. I just would have you know today, my friend, that oil and war are practically synonyms down there in the Middle East. There has been so much fussing, fighting, and feuding over the years over in the Middle East over oil that it is absolutely absurd. Just right down ridiculous. But it's primarily because of its usages. You see, in a sense, it would be very difficult for us to survive without oil because oil carries a number of significant usages. We use it to bake and cook our food. We use it to heat our homes and to run our cars, to fly our planes and to power our trains. We use oil to generate electricity, to lay asphalt, to make weak wax candles and to make different types of plastics and even to make all sorts of synthetic materials. And that's why even the songwriter says, give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp, just keep me burning, burning, burning. Keep me burning till the break of day. You see, folk, that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. The necessity and grave importance of having oil in our lamps. You see, just before Jesus comes, the Bible prophesies that the oil crisis, the last oil crisis, the last major fight over oil in this world, is going to occur in the church. Yes, among its professed membership, and between two classes of believers, between the righteous and the wicked, between the weeds and the tears, and between the wise and the foolish. Therefore, this has become the focus of our study today. But before we go any further into our study today, I need to ask you a question. It's a personal question. Is there sufficient oil in your lamp? Are you burning for Jesus? Are you on fire for Jesus? Let's go and read all about it. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 25, and we're going to read and also expound or comment on verses 1 through 13. That's Matthew chapter 25, and we are commenting on verses 1 through 13. In verse 1, Jesus says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now the first phrase that we come across here that requires some kind of exposition is the phrase, the kingdom of heaven. I just would have you know today, folks, that this phrase is a direct reference to the truths pertaining to the heavenly kingdom. You see, that's what Jesus is referring to when he uses the phrase. He's talking about truth according to heaven's system of truth. 
expounded in relation to an incident that is to be unfolded upon the earth. Hence he uses the phrase, and he prefaces a lot of his parables with the phrase, the kingdom of heaven, comparing the spiritual world or the spiritual realm to earthly reality. By the phrase, ten virgins, we understand that uh, is represented the church. Now they are called virgins because they profess to possess a pure faith. In fact, even the number 10 is significant in relation to this because that's a direct reference to the Ten Commandments. So it means that they believe these 10 virgins in living according to the Ten Commandments. Hence, they are called virgins because they possess a pure faith. In fact, they are God's they represent God's true church, God's remnant church, hence God's commandment-keeping people, which profess to keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy according to Revelation 12:17 and Revelation 19 and verse 10. By the lambs, we understand, is a representation of the word of God. Psalm 119 and verse 105 says that thy word is what? A lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. Amen. What could we do without the light that streams from the holy pages of God's word? Well, the text goes on to tell us that all ten of these virgins went forth to meet the bridegroom. And in my book, this means that they were all waiting and supposed to be preparing for the second coming of Jesus Christ. All ten of them. But at verse 2, we are told that five of them were wise. That means that they had some good sense. And the other five were foolish. That means that 50% went out prepared, the wise. And the other 50% went out to meet their Lord unprepared, which was the foolish. At verse 3, Jesus goes on to say that they that were foolish took their lamps, which represents the word of God, so they went out with a knowledge of the word, but they took no oil with them. Hm. They took the lamps, a knowledge of the word, but they took no oil. Now we know that the oil represents the Holy Spirit. The psalmist has spoken to us already about the oil. He said, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. So we understand the oil to represent the Holy Spirit. So the foolish had the knowledge, a knowledge of the Word of God, but they did not have the Holy Spirit to go along with that knowledge. They had a head knowledge of the Word. They did not have the Holy Spirit in their hearts. This means, this does not mean, my friends, that they were not influenced by the Holy Spirit, but they certainly were not possessed by Him. And there is a vast difference for us to understand today of being influenced by the Spirit of God and being possessed by the Spirit of God. In verse 4, Jesus says that the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. That's what made them wise in this power, my friends. The wise took extra oil in their vessels with their lamps. That means they carried along with the lamp an extra flagon or flask of oil, which represented symbolically their preparation for the latter rain experience, for an extra outpouring of the Holy Ghost. That is what is represented here by the extra oil that would be needed to pass through the crisis period that's just up ahead, that is rushing us at the speed of a hurricane successfully. In order to go through successfully, we have to have the Holy Spirit. And verse 5 Jesus says that while the bridegroom, the bridegroom tarried, that they all slumbered and slept. 
Now, to me, that represents perhaps a quiet period, like just before the great time of trouble breaks out, perhaps similar to a COVID-19 lockdown, maybe somewhat similar to what we are going through right now. A short time of mercy when a full preparation uh, could still be made in quietness and behind closed doors. Oh yes, my friends, God has given us time now through this COVID-19 lockdown to get ourselves together and to set our spiritual houses in order. Now we have the time to pray and to seek Him as we ought and to spend time pouring over the Scriptures. We have time now to, to witness for Jesus and to make calls and to send out uh, letters and different things to introduce our family members, friends, relatives, and other friends to Jesus. God is giving us time to prepare to meet Him in peace during this COVID-19 lockdown. But at verse 6, Jesus says that at midnight, there was a cry made. That means, my friends, the midnight cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Yes, my friends, that is the midnight cry. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. And we know right now that the bridegroom is coming. Yes, my friends, whether we still believe it or not, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is coming back again to this world to receive us unto himself that where we are, that where he is, there we may be also. And so at verse 7, Jesus goes on to say that all those virgins arose and trimmed their lambs. What does it mean? It means that in the process of trimming their lambs, cutting the wicks and checking the oil, that the foolish uh, made one big realization. In other words, they noticed that their lambs were running low on oil. Yes, naturally, if you don't take any extra oil with you, then all the oil that you have is in the lamp. So if you've been out for any length of time, those who knows anything about the bushes, oil will burn down on you fast. And therefore, because they were running low on oil, they made sort of a foolish request to the wise. At verse 8, Jesus says that the foolish, and I guess that's why they were called foolish, because of the nature of their request, and foolish people have a tendency at times to say foolish things. You don't have to say amen, but that's just a fact of life. But they say to the wise, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. My Lord, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. Can you get a load of that, my friends? Uh, I, I think, you know, I, I really, I really believe that they had some nerve. In my book, they had some nerve to be asking the righteous, the wise, for their oil. And here's several reasons why. Number one, because they had the same opportunities and privileges to prepare to meet the bridegroom and to be ready. Secondly, they had the same time and hours for heartfelt prayer and Bible study. Thirdly, they had the same opportunities to witness and share with others the good news of the kingdom. Oh yes, they had it, my friends. They had it. They had the same chances to surrender their wills without reservation to the constraining, convicting power and influence of the Holy Spirit of God, daily and hourly. And they had the same provisions to die to self and to that sinful Adamic nature that is in man and become a full-fledged partaker of the divine nature of God. So they had all the exact same privileges of the wise. This is the reason why I say they had some nerve because they had the same of everything. Yet they say, give us of your oil because our lamps are gone out. 
Now, brothers and sisters, today I need to bring something to your attention that is very important for us to understand before that time comes. Because you see, folks, even if the righteous wanted to, if the wise wanted to, they would not be able to give the foolish a piece of their character. A character that had been developed over time. That's number one. You see, folks, the development of the virtues and attributes that constitute the character of Christ happens or develops over the course of a lifetime. It's the work of a lifetime. It is a gradual and protracted, well-orchestrated process that is effected by the Holy Spirit of God and thereby impossible to impart. What am I saying, bottom line? Bottom line, I am saying that character, my friend, is not transferable. Neither is the presence of the Holy Spirit from one heart to another that has not been prepared for him through complete surrender and death to self. So if they hadn't surrendered themselves to the Holy Spirit, they could not ask for more of his presence. You see, folks, what I'm saying, bottom line, is that they were asking for the impossible and didn't realize it. And the righteous could not accommodate them because character is not transferable. And the Holy Spirit cannot live in us. He cannot function within our hearts and souls without surrender. But at verse 9, Jesus goes on to say that the wise answered, the wise knew exactly how to handle the unwise, the foolish. Jesus says at verse 9 that the wise answered saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and for you, but rather go to them that sell and buy for yourself. Of course, this was the attempt of the wise to subvert the approach of the foolish. Why was that necessary? Because the wise knew that this request was impossible and that subsequently that the foolish could become dangerous by a refusal to give them the impossible. Therefore, they diverted them by telling them to go and buy for yourselves, knowing that by the time they got back to them, that the bridegroom would have already come. <laughs> I'll tell you, that's why the Bible says, be wise as a serpent, but harmless as a dove. You see, my friends, in verse 10, Jesus says that while they went out to buy, something very interesting happened. Why, obviously, the bridegroom comes. And the record goes on to say, And they that were ready, those who prepared themselves and were ready, went in with him, that is with Jesus, to the marriage, and the door was shut. My Lord. We need to understand that today. I'm going to try my very best to unpack it since succinctly. Succinctly. You see, my friends, what is being said here is that they that were ready went in with him, that is with Jesus, to the marriage, is referring specifically to the judgment that has been in session now from the year 1844. A lot of people do not realize that a judgment is going on in heaven even as we speak. Oh yes, my friend, this judgment has been going on from the year 1844. If you continue to stick with and follow our services, we will eventually get to a study that shows how we as Seventh-day Adventists have come to that conclusion from the scriptures based on a prophecy that is given in the book of Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, that unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary in heaven be cleansed. In other words, that the work of the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven will begin. This is an awesome work of investigation of God's people to determine who among the dead will be eligible and worthy for the first resurrection 
and who among the living will be worthy or eligible to be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. The Bible tells us clear, clearly and plainly that the hour of his judgment is come in Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 and 7. In this judgment, my friends, we understand that names are called and cases are investigated. Destiny decisions are made that serve as wedding vows for the righteous. Yes, my friends, they are married to Jesus before Almighty God into judgment. The wise are, the righteous are, in the sense that they are fully sealed and filled with the Holy Spirit. And therefore, they are fixed in the ways of righteousness forever. That's what it means by those who already went in with him and the door was shut. You know, the scripture says that God shuts a door that no man can open. And he opens a door that no man can shut. But usually when God shuts a door, it usually symbolizes the close of a grace period, the close of probation. So it says that they went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. So my friends, that sort of means that when their name was called and their cases were investigated, that at the conclusion of this investigation, a final irrevocable, irretractable decision had to be made as to where they would be spending the very rest of eternity. And of course, that's going to be hand in hand with him, with Jesus. Those who have sold out completely the world, the flesh, and the devil, sick and tired of sin, self, and Satan, who have given themselves over to God without reservations, who have allowed the Holy Spirit to exterminate sin in their hearts, every darling sin, every cherished idol, every evil habit, every sterling vice, and have surrendered, turned over their hearts, their lives, their all to Jesus and to the Holy Ghost are going to pass the judgment of the righteous, the investigative judgment that is now in session in the heavenly courts up above. You see, friends, to be ready, it says that those that were ready went in means that they had already passed the investigative judgment of the righteous and that their cases were already decided and approved. Amen. It means that they were sealed already with the seal of the living God in the sense of the term married to Jesus. In that sense of the term. That's what it means to be married to Jesus. It means that you are sealed, you are merged and united to him forever. I mean, I can't think of a better experience that we could encounter or have this side eternity than to be sealed in the love of God, in the ways of righteousness, the principles of righteousness fixed in our hearts for eternity. Yes, Jesus said that the door was shut. You know what that means? That means that we allow those doors to close on us. It means that it was too late for anyone to change. As in the case of Noah and the ark, the Bible plainly states how after the animals and Noah's family had went into the ark, the record says, that the Lord himself shut them in. Oh yes, my friends, as Genesis chapter 7 and verse 16, the record says he sealed them in the ark of safety from the torrential waters of the flood. And I just want to let you know today that he's going to do the same with his people again Huh? At the end of time, mm -hmm. by sealing them in the judgment that is going on even now as we speak, sealing them in the ways of righteousness forever. That's why it's so important for us to be constantly choosing the good and refusing the evil around the clock, around the clock, telling the devil no, where to go and how to get there, Federal Expressway. When Jesus finishes his meditorial work in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, 
We understand from the scriptures, Revelation chapter 22 and verse 11, that he makes a pronouncement, a final benediction upon the entire world. Revelation 22 verse 11, it says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy will remain holy still. At this point, we understand, my friends, that probation for the entire world closes and there will be no second chance. At verse 11, Jesus goes on to say that afterward, afterward came also the other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Open, open to us. But you know, my friends, there comes a time when it's too late even for the Lord to open for us. Oh yes, my friends, it was too late. Their cry was too late. They cried, my friends, and not, but their cry was too late. Their probation had already been closed, their destiny fixed, their fate was sealed. It was too late. One songwriter says, too late, too late shall be the cry, Jesus of Nazareth passing you by. Oh yes, my friends, that's why we are admonished to seek the Lord while he may be found, to call upon him while he is near. The scripture says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. I wish somebody could shout amen out there, even if I can't hear you. Oh yes, my friend, a time is quickly coming upon us when time shall be no more. That's why we need to seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is still near. At verse 12, Jesus goes on to say, as he finishes out in the parable, that he answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, and this is not the first time he say, he said he's saying this. He says it also in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Now in verse 21, Jesus says of Matthew chapter 7, I never knew you. Remember, he says that. He said, because many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not done this and that and the other, all these great feats and how we passed our tracks and conducted Bible studies and how we, uh, we, we, we fed the hungry and we gave clothes to the naked and we did all of these wonderful works. But Jesus says, depart from me. I never knew you. You never knew me. Because if you did, you could not continue in iniquity. He said, depart from me. I never knew you. Ye that work iniquity. See, we have to allow Christ to come in and to clean us up, my friends. Otherwise than that, the most that we have to offer God and the host of heaven and the inhabitants of this sin-ridden world, this sin-cursed, sin-infected, infested world, is lip service. That's all that we can offer at best without the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Jesus is saying, you have already demonstrated to me by your lifestyle and your daily choices and all your lawlessness exactly how you feel about me. I'm not impressed, Jesus says, with the lip service. He said, you never did love me because if you had truly loved me, my friend, then you would have kept my commandments as I commanded you. I told you from the very onset of your experience, if you love me, keep my commandments. But you know what? You demonstrated to me exactly how much you loved me by your unfaithfulness over the course of your life. You disrespected my word. You disrespected and trampled upon the precepts of my law. Therefore, depart from me. I never even knew you. Coming to the conclusion of the parable, Jesus rounds off by saying, Watch ye therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man is coming. 
what I say unto you, Jesus says, I say unto all to watch, to pray, and to be ready, my friends, for Jesus to come. Now, I will have you know today, friends, that the lesson we gathered from the parable is a charge to obtain the precious oil while the doors of probation still stand ajar. That is to make a full preparation to meet Jesus by cooperating with the Holy Spirit without reservation in the process of sanctification. That is through strict obedience to the principles of God's word. And that is so that we can be prepared to receive the latter rain and thus be fully ready to meet Jesus when he comes and pierces the clouds of eternal glory. What a day of rejoicing that's going to be, my friends. I don't know about you, but I want to be ready to meet Jesus when he comes. And we want to be ready to walk into Jerusalem, just like Peter, James, and John. So may the Lord help us all, my friends. To these ends today as we submit ourselves completely to his guidance and control that by the grace of God we will not be foolish virgins but that we will be seated among the wise and among the righteous in the kingdom of God down there at the marriage supper of the Lamb after everything is said and done. I don't know about you, my friends, but I want to be there when they crown him King of Kings. God bless you, my friends. God bless you real good. And until next week, I want to admonish you, my friends, to have faith in God. Make sure all your sins are cleared. Have faith in God, confess them, and please, don't be scared. Have faith in God. Don't get caught up out there, lost and unprepared. Dear friend, have faith in God. Have faith in God amidst all your effort and toil. Have faith in God. Plant all your seeds in fertile oil, in fertile soil. Have faith in God, my friend, and prepare to receive the extra oil. Dear friend, have faith in God and remember to believe also in him regardless of what it is that you are facing in your life just know that we have an anchor that grips the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll and his name is Jesus
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God eternal, we thank you so much once again today, Lord, for this golden opportunity, O Lord, to share the word of the living God, whereby we are made wise unto salvation and eternal life through your dear Son, Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that we will take, you will help us to take these truths to heart, really press them home, O God, so that our lives could be different, so that we could have not just a clearer understanding, but also the will and the impetus and the power, O oh God, to change. That we will literally and physically be ready to meet you when you come. Lord, we pray that you will affect real change in our hearts and lives, O oh God. We don't want to be caught out there, you know, 50% caught out there among the foolish virgins who had all the time in the world to prepare, to pray and to study the scriptures and to share our faith with others. Lord, help us not to squander these precious probationary moments that you extend to us in great mercy. Help us to use the time wisely, O oh God. Help us to redeem the time, knowing that the time, our time is short. So we pray, Father God, that your Holy Spirit will come on us, one and all today, and help us to take this, this message to heart and apply the principles to our lives so that your Spirit could transform us and fit us and make us ready to meet you when you burst the clouds of glory to take your little children home, O oh God, that they can be forever where you are in paradise. Now, Father, we pray once again for those who have been stricken with the coronavirus, that COVID-19, each broadcast, we pray that your healing power will come out from this screen. Please let it stream into the hearts of those, O oh God, who need your healing touch. I pray that you'll stretch forth your healing hand, O oh God, and touch them from the crown of their head down to the soles of their feet. Let them sense your healing power passing and pulsating through every bone, muscle, sinew, tissue of their body, all through all their vital organs. We pray that you'll rebuke the devil and bind the work of the enemy. In Jesus' name, give them healing. Give them deliverance. And give them the victory today, we pray, in the all-powerful name of our crucified and risen Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen, my friends. God bless you. 
And we look forward to seeing you next week. Should God spare our lives. Same time. Same place. And we praise God. For you. Because we love you. And we want you. Each of our listening friends. Who are listening by way of this broadcast. To be in God's eternal kingdom. That is our prayer for you. That is our wish for you. And God, that is God's plan. And design for your life. To spend the rest of eternity with him. God bless you now. Until next week. Thank you for joining us. Tune in this evening for AYM at 5 p.m. On Facebook, YouTube, and our website. And Vespers at 6 p.m. on our conference line. Until next time, God bless.